Greetings world, um, welcome to Full Circle with Zah. Today you're in for a treat, largely because the woman, the giant, the amazing <laughs> diva I'm going to be having a conversation with is someone I've loved for a long time. And when I love, when I love, I mean love deeply, deeply, deeply. <laughs> um, but now she's like this multi-hyphenate woman. She is activist, creative, um, a director, judge of fantastic advertising awards. Um, she is business owner. She's business partner. She is partner in life. She mm. is life creator. I could go on and on and on. So I'll let her do her own introduction. People know her as Nkabi Sen Mudao, but to me, she's just the delightful Nkabi Sen. Nkabi, <laughs> welcome. That to is such a show. wonderful introduction. Thank you. Well, I could have gone on and on and on and on. Like it was she, good. I was like, oh, wow, I need a, like a recording of it so I can play it every day in the morning. What did I leave out? To put me out. I don't, I think you've covered it quite well. Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything you've left out. That was very good. Okay, so then we'll peel all those layers around. Okay, yeah, happy but to peel. Before we do that, though, because mm. I know that there's a way that you introduce yourself. So how yes. do you introduce yourself? When people I say, usually oh, say, oh, yeah, I say I'm Khabi Singh. I'm, I'm a co-founder and a, a CCO at Think, if it's in a professional setting. Yeah. Otherwise, I say I'm Khabi Singh. I'm from Woodbank. Um, I, I live in Johannesburg. These are my interests. Or if I'm going for a, an immunization visit with my baby, I say, I'm Khabi saying I'm Kwezi's mom. Our uh, slot is for 11 o'clock. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how it usually goes. <laughs> You've got all I have a tailored approach. A tailored approach. Yeah. So I'm laughing because somebody once said to me, you should really worry mm -hmm. if you're at a party and mm. someone's talking about your IQ because it means your social oh my skills gosh, are very dark. Yeah. Or if you add school and someone's yeah. talking about your social skills, it means your IQ yeah. is very dark. That is so funny. So true. You, so you then have figured out the art of, of customization and advertising. Yeah. Like, what's your target audience? Exactly. Come exactly. Come yeah. for the people you have a I have with. made people add social things who then tell you what they do for a living. So, yeah. hello, I'm William such and such. I'm CEO of and we're at like a bride or like a one-year-old's birthday. I already know like where this conversation is. Exactly. Like. I've actually yeah. had a guy offer me a business card at a bride. Oh. And I said to him, my hands are filled. One <laughs> champagne, the other champagne. Where do you, where do you suggest? <laughs> do you that? want to what do with the business card? card? Like, what do you want me to do yeah, with Yeah, that card? is weird. But so I am a little bit tailored where I do my introductions. Yeah. So, Full Circle has been running for almost a year now, mm. and you and I have congratulations. About it. Thank you. You and I have spoken about it, but tell mm. me why you said yes today. Well, I find that whenever I'm in conversation with you, I come out learning more than I actually offer. So I thought, let me say yes to another learning opportunity. This is the part <laughs> where you say nice things about me. Yeah. I do, I do. I find that like. Um, you know, they also say like teacher learns most. So sometimes um, I'm, I'm looking to like just reflect on what it is that people are asking me. And then because I'm talking about it, I'm learning like, oh, wow. So from this experience, maybe even in my own journey, this is what I can learn. Um, having had a few steps away from it. And then obviously um, chatting to you, I always unearth new insights, like be it about Little things like, what does it say the way that you introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. Which is something I've picked up now in the last few seconds. That is ridiculous. Mm. You say such like, <laughs> you have to stop because I'm the one who has is, to ask It's you so easy these. to I'm... amplify the truth. <laughs> so easy. I've got to ask you these deep mm. questions so I can't be distracted by all this love you're throwing my way. Okay, which... I'm, I'm going to get serious. No more flattery. Um, but you. that was the truth. No, so, but thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I do believe that... Um, Praise does for humans what water does for plants. Me too, and, yeah. And unfortunately, uh, particularly in black culture, we mm. really, really, at least for me, I was raised in a, in a home and in a setting mm. where people felt praise would make you have a big head. Absolutely, right? especially to women, right? Yes. Like just like, so like mm. no, mm. knowing what you're good at is an impediment. Right? And yet knowing yeah. what you're good at actually sets you on a path it does. to match that passion with your purpose and your energy and you direct all your fantasticness to it and then you become 
this wonderful human. Absolutely. Life. And I think we should compliment one another more. I and mean, if we look at things like uh, the like gender pay gap, for yeah. example, I think is fostered in part by little praise that yeah. goes to women. So if I'm constantly hearing, you have to get Sizagele on this project, she is uh, very insightful, she's agile, she's going to bring a level of professionalism that will set this product apart. If I'm hearing that from multiple sources, when she comes and she says, well, I charge five rand for these services, I don't question that, yes. right? Because um, part of the uh, the thing that this word of mouth is doing is laying the foundation for her to, for her to come and ask for what she's um, for what her uh, services are worth, for yes. example. So, I do think praise is important, and yeah. it and it has to be kind. It doesn't mm. have to be polite. Right? Yeah, because exactly. The 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 distinction for me is that polite is what we say to uncles who have bad breath. But we still go, it's so good to see you. <laughs> right? That's gross. Whereas kind is just a few more minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I, I, wow. I, would, I would advocate kindness because that is sincere. Whereas mm. politeness is politically correct. Wow. And that's why we get so many things wrong because we never get the opportunity to be raised and to evolve because people are busy out here being polite. Be kind. That's great. I love that. I mean, is that mm. is that how you 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 have thought about it before? Or? No, I've actually had never thought about the distinction. I do know that politeness makes me uncomfortable, you know, because I feel like something is being concealed. I don't know what it was, yeah. but now I I hear it when you're saying because when you're being kind and you're slipping somebody a mint, you're actually um, you're addressing maybe their shortcoming, but not in a way that. Um, like shames them publicly in any way um, and they can see that you love them in that way yeah there's a real distinction and I think you're not uncomfortable when someone passes you a mint yes um, but, but when you realize your breath was bad that whole time <laughs> nobody said anything yes. you see that is um, the flip side of it it's really great I love it so yeah. so your journey, I don't even know where we're going to start, but maybe mm. let's start because I can hear my mother's voice going, <laughs> when and dad start from the beginning? Which, so then, Good advice. So then let's start from the beginning. Yeah. You and I met, I think it was 2011 or 12, right? Mm, it my, was, yeah, 2011, I think. 11, oh my mm. God, right? Yeah. So I am now doing this firefighting thing, which is what Zah seems to gravitate <laughs> towards. Mm. Uh, we're trying to revive Grey South Africa. At the time, it had gotten out of fashion and fallen out of flavor. Mm. Because nobody thought there was anything left in that agency to fix, to work with, or any talented human beings. Wow. And I said yes, because I'm, I'm always drawn to the things that can be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a growth point, but it can also become a liability. Because, it can. When, because when things are going great, you think I'm bored because there's mm -hmm. nothing to fix. Then you and Mugondi, the wonderful Mugondi, who runs away from cameras. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, um, had come in for a, for a, for a, for a chat. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to myself, I don't even know whether I even communicated to the two of you, but I remember saying to myself that even though we were not able to contain your magic in that particular environment, and thank God we weren't. Yeah, it right? actually worked out, thankfully. Um, mm. Here is where you are. But I, I, there was something in your conviction. Mm. Because, the, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who are super, super talented, right? And arrogant. Mm. I meet a lot of people who are arrogant and not talented. And then I meet people who are in the middle. And then there's this special breed of people who have integrity, mm -hmm. intelligence, and energy. And they bake that with a sense of humility, a humility that doesn't mean you want to be a doormat, but it's a humility that mm -hmm. says, I know enough to move forward, but not enough to conquer the world just yet. And mm -hmm. that's what I sense. That's what radiated from the two of you so wow. here we are almost 10 years later mm -hmm. and you are now co-founder of think creative africa so just walk me through that journey the yeah. czar we have a conversation <laughs> to czar i am co-founder of a shit hot amazing agency now so wow quite a yeah it's quite a journey i, I do remember that when we met you um in 2011 we were late for one of the meetings we had with you and you were just like 
this is unacceptable. We don't work like this. And we really took it to heart. So that uh, changed one of the the things, the way that we do uh, business and meetings and that kind of thing. So that was good. Um, so at, at that time, we were looking for a change. We were then working at Ogilvy Johannesburg. And we're looking for another agency. Um, we came and had a conversation at Gray. We went and had another one at FCB. And then we ended up moving there, um, which was, I think, a good move in the sense that the the uh, accounts that we ended up having access to work on were really career changing. Um, we pitched on the global Coca-Cola p- uh, piece. And I mean, like just pitching on a global account is really good experience. Um, and then we won a piece of it. We did incredible work, which um, I still look back at and go, um, you know, that really ignited my love for what advertising can be and um, how far the work that we do can go because the campaign we worked on was um, share a Coke. And <clears throat> typically what would happen is we would get campaigns from uh, other markets um, in the first world. So we would get a campaign maybe from North America and they would say, can you localize this a little bit and flight it? And then you would maybe have to do a reshoot of one or two scenes, change the voiceover, and that would be it. Um, that was an opportunity for us to really come up with something that worked for the African market. But it resonated so much inside the Coca-Cola business that they adopted that for the markets around the world, which I thought was great. Yeah, it was like quite a boost in our confidence as creative people, which is very important, I think, uh, early on in the journey. Because while I mean, it's not arrogance that's going to help you get somewhere in the creative industry, but certainly you need to have a certain level of confidence. Like you need to build a oneness with your instincts. Mm. Um, so when you make a decision, for example, in art direction, you need to be confident in like, I think that's a really instinctively good visual decision to make. And you are constantly having to defend those visual decisions. So some of it is um, intuition and it's hard to put that in words and say yeah, the reason <laughs> the reason I think it's good to use this color palette is this. It doesn't always resonate with your audience. Yeah. But when you have moments like that, which kind of validate your value as um, a creative professional where you go, I was right, my instincts were correct in this instance and I can learn um, how to apply that same thing elsewhere and then it helps your confidence. So, I mean, at the at that time in our career, we worked on many, many campaigns, local, ones that went abroad. Um, and we were focused on creating work that people could see themselves in. Um, we're both like family people. Yeah. So when we'd make a piece of work, we want our families to go, wow, that's really great. Not to feel embarrassed or to feel that... Um, we're misrepresenting our people in any way, which is quite big. Um, so yeah, we would look for local insights that would make the work rich. And that became like our distinctiveness within the agencies that we worked. So more and more clients would come to the agency and say, I'm looking to do something really local, which wasn't a thing before, I think. Um, I think the, the advertising industry maybe for a period was looking to just look very international Mm. and then there was a like a turning point where uh, clients realized that the more local the flavor the more you connect with the consumer and ironically the more you connect globally because people want to see what's special about Africa you know when I'm watching the commercials at whether it's CAN, DNAD I'm always so enamored by the work that comes out of like South America or um, Asia, you know, because it's so culturally rich, you can see that it would never really come out of America or anywhere else. It feels like um, their people are in the work. So when that happened, it was great because it felt like the way that we approach briefs was becoming more relevant, which was great. So we would get another brief and we would give it um, the same approach um, and, and it started to like really get good results and then there was something that we would always meet which is um of course in different agencies you have uh various layers of hierarchy 
Um, you also have like the kind of work an agency does. Mm. So each agency has its own legacy, its mm. own feel, all of that. And where we felt like it's not 100% mirroring what we want to do or within the hierarchy, some things are dying. And um, we were like, what if we, we just made an agency where the yeah. kind of work that we're talking about yeah. and laughing about by ourselves could actually make it through the funnel? That would be cool, you know? And then we toyed with that idea for some time until we felt like maybe now's a good time. We don't really have um, your classical responsibilities yeah. like children or big and bonds or anything. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so we can be a little bit on the risky side. So then, yeah, we quit. We started to do a bit of freelance um, to like earn some money. Okay, to your parents, so like, hi, mom and dad. You know, we're leaving <laughs> these very solid jobs <laughs> to just go and rough it. And but I don't we think we ever free. said that we were leaving our jobs. I think we said that we were freelancing or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you didn't really explain what freelancing means. No. But they, I mean, like, we we were saying, oh, you know, for the next few months, we're going to be working at Y&R. And then after that, we'll be working for another agency. So it kind of felt like... There were jobs. We were going to be contractors or okay. something. I don't know. Okay. Um, and then little by little, we, you know, introduced the idea that we're building this business. So that was met with quite a bit of support, thankfully, um, from our families. Okay. There was no, like, what are you doing? Go back to your job. There was a little bit, but... The support was enough to carry us through the moments oh, where, fantastic. yeah, that was fantastic. good. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I think we were so determined. I'm sure you couldn't have, like, you know, told us. Otherwise. Yeah, we were so, so determined. And, you know, we were just going to take over the world. And we had this one idea where we were like, um, we're going to build an agency that does work for good. Mm. So... Um, if if we if you said to us who are our clients going to be, we would have said like the UN, um, change.org, mm. wherever. We would have said like these do good as Doctors Without Borders. Yeah. Those will be our clients. Yeah. And um, okay, very quickly we realized those companies are amazing, but they don't have lots of budgets for marketing. Actually, what, what happens is agencies with um, a little bit of money, um, they'll do the work proactively. Mm pro bono they'll pay for a lot of it so that the message is you know carried out mm. but they don't have money lying around yeah so then we very quickly realized oh my goodness we're gonna have to go um and like kind of pivot our idea and then how do we then take clients who want to do uh classical marketing and make that work good good yeah so then we changed our idea of how we would um build think and I think we've tried with every brief that we've gotten since we started in 2016 to see is there a way we can include that sensibility in this work if not and the client is like listen to me I want a pack shot and a price and I want it out there in three minutes then um, what we try and do is make sure that we're not creating damage so if there are things that um, are there that are, are like not truthful we would challenge um, or if there are ways in which they've been uh, depicting that market. Mm. You know, in marketing, we talk a lot about the mass customer and there are these like stereotypes and tropes about yeah. who that person is. Yeah. If we can then push, you know, the, the borders of that to be further and further out because we know those people, we know so many of them, we are them yeah. in many s scenarios and we know that they aren't just one-dimensional um, Sistembi, even Sistembi herself, mm. is not just what you think yeah. uh, she is because she works the work she does and she dresses the way she does. Um, so if we can, then we'll like push the borders off of that conversation to then have work that's a little bit more representative. That, that is so heartwarming for me. Because, <laughs> I mean, um, and, the, and the work will never stop. Because if you look at 1992 when Herd Boys was formed, right? Yeah. You had five boys, five men mm -hmm. who had the same idea, which is we want to present um, images of who we truly are, mm -hmm. uh, dignified black beings who mm. are complex and complicated, who are joyful, who are fearful, who are confident, who, mm. who have dreams. We want to create and present the complete spectrum of who we are as human beings. Mm. Right? So that was 92. 
we're now in 2021 and the conversations are still, still going yeah right? and the reason they're ongoing is because the stereotypes won't unlatch um there's so much invested mm-hmm. in the bracketing of black beings a certain way so much is invested in keeping us small in keeping us dangerous if you're black and male oh yes if keep, if, yeah. uh, keeping us promiscuous if you're black and female mm-hmm. or angry if you're black or and just female. a strong mother or figure just strong mother figure so so, <laughs> yeah. so whatever the the original attachments the reason those labels stick is because mm-hmm. it benefits somebody else yes absolutely so the joy of having mm-hmm. outfits like think almost take a prick to that balloon is really important because mm. we have to pop as many balloons as possible so that by the time your children their children if that's what they choose to do the conversation moves like we mm. have an obligation to just like just move the conversation just just a little bit you don't yeah. have to carry the world just two little bit, degrees yeah. to the left yeah you know, absolutely two degrees to the left and that's it. Yeah, we look forward to do that on every piece of work, you know. And I think it's not just um, like black South Africans who are misrepresented constantly. It's everybody else, too, because they have to remain in those roles. Like, um, what does the white man look like in an ad in South Africa? They always have to be um, powerful, a professional, um, impenetrable, kind of villainous in yeah. a sense. Like, they can't just be people with... Uh, feelings and complexity and all of these things um and i think everybody is like under the pressure of these mm-hmm. stereotypes yeah and 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 the work that tends to travel as well is work that that latches onto a human truth right mm. so for example i've loved that oreo ad i mean it was done in north america eventually south africa had its own version where yes with it. the baby it was yeah. Yeah. Like, it was universal so mm. you don't have to be a monster to understand that the little munchkin what they're talking about mm. right? you don't have to be a mother to understand you absolutely just a human, a human just being a person. Who understands what little people go through mm. so now think creative is now six years old right? yes six well it's six years old next year actually this yeah. is our fifth year but why do you think clients come to you Sure, I think about this question, every day. The question, the question is, how much are you doing? Mm. Are you still doing the, the chasing or people are now coming mm. to you? What's, has a shift happened over the last five years? I think one has, yeah, definitely. Um, before we were doing a lot of work so that clients can get to know us, um, pitching ourselves, doing work proactively, just really putting ourselves out there, trying to do a bit of PR around the work that we do. Um but now we do see clients approaching us um, and interesting clients as well, you know, the kind that we would want to go approach. So that's really encouraging. I've, I ask myself every day why clients come to us. And I think they're like some, I think there are various reasons. So um, I think some clients come to us because they see the work that we do and they, they think that that approach would be relevant for their brands as well. Um, I think some clients are looking for a way to transform their supply chain and it's a very straightforward thing for them. Um, And then I think other clients maybe are, this is so like strange to say, but I guess playing into a stereotype in a sense. Um, And then like usually our thing is to just try and um, adjust their view of what we are and who we are. Same Once they're in the, the room, <clears throat> and maybe that we would be cheap. That's a big one. Okay. Um, you'd be cheap because you're small, or you'd be cheap because you're black, or you'd be cheap because you're female. <laughs> I think it's all of those things. <laughs> small, black, female, cheap. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So that is quite a challenge. But I think in the last year, um, the last two years, the conversation has kind of improved. So even if they did come thinking. Let me find a cheap outfit that can do things uh, quickly. So like quick, cheap, nasty. Yeah. Um, when they do meet us, then they realize what we have to offer and the conversation progresses. And then a lot of the time they become kind of like um, an ambassador for us. Okay. They'll, they'll tell other people about oh, us, which is good as well. Yeah. And have you had to fire a client <clears throat> in your young life? Yes. 
We are so crazy that we have. Um, <laughs> but what? But what? what so, how do you decide that this client is not a fit for us? How do you? Decide? Yeah, we have like um, three criteria for a good think client. Mm -hmm. The first criteria is um, is this a lucrative opportunity? So can we actually earn a living off of this client? Um, the second is are they good people to work with? So do they align in terms of values? Yeah. They don't want to destroy the universe. Yeah. They don't have um, prejudice uh, values yeah. governing their business um, and their communications. Yeah. And then they're also just good human beings to talk to and interact with regularly because yeah. you do with clients. And then the third bit of criteria is, can we do amazing work, like the work that we um, envision for Think? Um, so, you know, can that work um, change the communication landscape? Can it win us some awards? Can it do great things for our people? Yeah. So those are the three things. And typically we would go for a client that has two of the three. Um, three out of three is the clients that we actually go after okay. pro um, proactively. Yeah. Um, the one out of three is just out of the question. So sometimes we start the relationship um, believing that maybe there are three out of three mm. or two, two out of three. Mm. <clears throat> and then we quickly discover one of the pieces has fallen away or is untrue or whatever. And that happened in the instance where we had to like walk away from a piece of business where we've gone, okay, these people have been abusive with our people. Um, a lot of what they said was the budget they were uh, working with actually isn't. And then... Finally, they're so prescriptive, mm. yeah, like misrepresentation of the scope of work that we'd be able to access. And then <clears throat> they're so prescriptive with the work that our vision actually isn't being served. So then we're like, basically, there's nothing here for us. And I think it helps. It's a healthy conversation to have with a client because sometimes it doesn't make them necessarily bad people. Mm. It just a bad alignment you know so I always think about it in terms of um, beverages mm. if you are really genuinely looking for a sweet caramelly um, chai tea and somebody gives you a shot of whiskey you're going to hate that right yeah. you're not looking for everything that yeah. whiskey is it's burning you it's just awful but that doesn't make whiskey a terrible drink there are people who literally pay any money just to get that shot of yeah. whiskey, they appreciate its scent, they love um, the strength, everything about it appeals to them, and they're in the right occasion for a whiskey as well. So I look at it that way, like if there isn't a great fit, um, it might just be that there's just a misalignment there, that's all. Um, it's, it's not to say that they uh, you know, it's not a reflection on the kind of people they are or and business they are. congratulations to you because sometimes um, you come across a, a piece of work that is so lucrative, you think if we fire them, <sighs> you may not have anybody come through that door yeah, again. I so how you. do you, because remember that you are in a partnership, yeah. so have you as a partnership had occasion to disagree on, okay, we really need to fire this person? Um, no, not not like really at odds mm. sometimes it's one person is ready to let go sooner than the other person okay. and then in that moment so i'll hear um Mugondi saying oh you know i want to let go this is a hypothetical example yes. maybe she wants to let go yes. for the three reasons we've listed yeah but then i'm like ah oh, you know the the budgets are low now but i i know that their incoming ceo has a mandate to market them more aggressively, which means the budgets will change in a month. So can we review this conversation at that point when the, the budget conversation is adjusted? And then we'll give it that time and revisit it again. Maybe a month later, the CEO comes and he's like, yeah, I want to spend aggressively, but I'm just going to go straight to the press and spend on advertorials. So, you There's know. There's no room for you.